with all this global complexity in mind, we come up with a new branch of science. It's really interdisciplinary. We call it biogeochemistry, which you can imagine takes biology, geology, and chemistry and tries to see how they interplay with each other. All right. Um, it's a really difficult branch of science. No one person can truly be a biogeochemist. Uh, it takes teams of people to come up with stuff. Um, but it's looking at how genes and the environment interact to alter chemistry and geology, right? and vice versa. Okay, Biogeochemistry can be very informative, and it um, influences all kinds of stuff, um, including fisheries management or elk hunt limits. Okay. Um, this is how we get the evolution of TAC polymerase, right? The, the biochemistry, the geology of a hot spring, okay? Um, all that coming together. So the idea here being that if, and this is a big if, if we know everything about an environment, right? the pH, sunlight, soil density, uh, salinity, air pressure, primary productivity, every gene that's in there, the genomes present in that environment could theoretically allow us to predict the future with perfect accuracy. Okay. We do live in a deterministic universe until we get down to the quantum level. Um, and so uh, causes have effects. Right. The problem is, is that this is just really too tough. All right, so what you're seeing here is from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the fifth annual report, figure 1-4. Right? You should probably know about this. It affects you and your kids, okay? It really does. What's going on here is that it's too difficult to know everything about the starting conditions in order to pr perfectly predict the future. There's just too much to measure, things that we haven't even thought of measuring, okay? Um, without knowing all the inputs, our outputs, our predictions, are going to be wrong, all right? So we measure as much as we can, estimate the rest, and we have a computer predict the future with the understanding that we're probably wrong. Now, stats is kind of weird in that you can't be certain of anything but you can know exactly how uncertain you are. All right, so here, these colored bands kind of growing towards the right are representative of the known uncertainty of our predictions of temperature anomaly. All right, so into the year 2035, that's what we were trying to predict. What's the average temperature of the Earth going to be in the year 2035? FAR there, in yellow, stands for the first annual report, and that was the first attempt at one of these IPCC type things, okay? It's got a nice big spread on it. That means that the true temperature in the year 2035, the average global temperature in that year, we are 95% sure that it's going to be somewhere in the range of that bar, okay? So if it comes out at 2 degrees warmer, this model is correct. If it comes out at 0.75 degrees warmer, this model is still correct, right? But we don't have that much certainty. Right? Our second annual report, SAR there, has less uncertainty. The third one has more again. And then AR4, the one previous to this, we had three different scenarios that we were trying to model, right, with different mitigation strategies. And those are the er errors for those, right? In this plot, each little point, those little squares, green and purple and orange, those are actual measured data, okay? The lines in those different colors are the moving averages for global uh, average climate. You see that going up. And then we get into these little scattery noodle stuff, all right? Those are predicted averages for these different models. And you see how it's just kind of crazy in there. It's hard to predict the future. So let's look at these. We've got FAR, SAR, TAR, and AR4, right? The first, second, and third, and fourth annual report, okay? This is what goes into a climate model. In the 1970s, it was sun, CO2, 
and rain. That was it. We fed three things into our predictive model and, and out comes the answer. Here's what the temperature is going to be in the future. Okay. Um, I wouldn't expect that to be super accurate. By the mid-1980s, we'd also said, hey, clouds exist in our hypothetical world, and so does land. And get this, even ice. Okay. So we're starting to get more variables put in. All right. By the first annual report, we had an ocean that we were taking into account, which was pretty cool, but it was treated as being one meter deep all across the surface of the Earth, just for simplicity. By the second annual report, we were looking at volcanic activity and sulfates also. Sulfates actually reflect sunlight back and help cool the Earth. And an ocean, okay, with actual depth and stuff. All right, by the third annual report, we're looking at all the aerosols, we're looking at the carbon cycle, we added rivers to the model, and ocean circulation. By the fourth report, we also added interactive vegetation and chemistry. All right, so we're starting to get more and more complicated, more and more complete, realistic picture of reality. That's what a model is. It's a simplified version of reality that we can look at with math, essentially. Okay, So we put in the values that we measure for the equation, and it gives us an output. Okay. Um, also, as we were going through making better and better predictive models as we got more data and more technology. We first divided up the world, you can see there in the top left in the first annual report, in 500 kilometer blocks. And everything in that block, square kilometer, was treated as identical. Okay. So there may be a river there, but predominantly it's forest, and so we said everything in here is exactly the same, it's forest. By the second annual report, we got that down to 250 kilometers, third, 180, and AR4, 110. Our goal is to go to 30 meters resolution. Okay, We can do that with our newer and better satellites. So this is equivalent to uh, the evolution of Mario over time. We're just getting better resolution. Okay, So when we look at this, you can see that sometimes better resolution leads to smaller predicted error, sometimes greater. Why greater in AR4 than in the second annual report? Well, it's because we started adding a bunch more parameters. Things like ocean wave height and circulating oceans and stuff. Things just get more complicated. All right, so that's your intro to ecological modeling. Okay, um, here's the simplest ecological model that I know of, it's the predator-prey equation. Right? What it's trying to do is predict population size based on what the population used to be and how many predators there are. Okay? And so that's the simple little equation and it makes this curvy line plot. Okay? As predators go up, prey goes down and then as prey runs out, predators don't have enough food, so they go down, so it's this kind of like lagged wave function. Okay? We can get more complicated. We can add in another competitor or N competitors. We can add a parasite species, and you can see how the equation starts to get a bit more freaky. Here's another model. This one is modeling endangered trout populations into the future based on things like water temp, riparian cover, how many plants are really close, how much shade is on there, how many introductions of these endangered fish you put out. And this is a different type of statistics, it's Bayesian statistics, but here's what some simple stuff that goes on in the background. Let me show you the model in action. All right, so say we clicked on that link there. This is Lahontan Cutthroat Trout Population Simulator. All right, Bunch of math going on in the background, but what we've got is a nice little tool that helps us predict the future with known uncertainty. All right, so we can pick a river. Let's see. So it's been done for all these different rivers. 
sure, whatever, Illinois. Here's that river on the map. Okay. <clears throat> we want to forecast for the year 2059. Um, how many non-native trout are in there? We can change this. Let's shoot it down a bit. Environmental stochasticity. That means how random, random events, that kind of thing. We'll take that down. The temperature range. Hmm. Well, now let's be realistic. It's going to be warmer. Okay. How much vegetation is in there? Reintroductions. Add 100 fish per year for 10 years. Let's run the simulation. Okay. Click on here, and there's our forecast population. All right. You can see carrying capacity. That's our K from our logistic growth. All right. That goes up if these changes happen. Growth potential. Um, total population size. It looks like we're doing better than we were before. This is current. That's now. If we start introducing fish in these conditions, that's our prediction. Okay. Pretty neat. All right, why are we talking about climate? Well, because this is the ecology chapter and climate plays a massive role in ecology. One thing to get through your head right now is that climate is not weather. Okay, repeat after me. Climate is not weather. Don't embarrass yourself, okay? Climate is long-term trends, decadal trends in temperature and precipitation, okay? This is not saying it's not gonna snow <clears throat> in the winter time just because of global warming. Yes, the average temperature of the earth can rise over a decadal time scale and it can still snow in the winter. You do not wanna be like this guy, Dines de Souza, right? Um, Famous for being a quote-unquote intellectual and convicted felon and everything, um, but recently pardoned because obviously. Now, this guy is also unaware that the Earth's axis is tilted and that winter still exists. So this right here um, is a tweet from Dinesh D'Souza uh, this last summer. That's correct. August 12th. 2019, he is shocked, I tell you, shocked that it's snowing in Australia. In the middle of August, no less. Well, this idiot doesn't realize that summer in the Northern Hemisphere is winter in the Southern Hemisphere, I suppose, right? Don't be like this guy, an idiot, okay? You need to think about decadal trends in temperature and precipitation if you're thinking about climate, right? So these are the trends we see, right? So this one's going through, I believe, on a weekly basis. Yep, weekly, and it's looking at temperature, and you can see it, a band of warm temperatures moving up and down through the seasons, right? This is cyclical, okay? And same thing for precipitation. This is what we're looking at, these large-scale patterns over a period of 10 years or more, okay? Which brings us to the IPCC again, all right? All those models they got running in the background, um, they are making predictions, and we do know how uncertain we are, right? We can say with 95% certainty that the temperature is going to be between X and Y, right? And so here it is, seasonal mean air temperature change. This is the predictions for the year 2035 with 95% certainty. The delta temperature, right? The change in temperature for December, January, February, and then on the bottom for June, July, August. So this is winter, this is summer, all right? The change in temperature for the year 2035. And it's color coded. So up here in the Arctic, we're seeing that red. We're looking at two to two and a half degrees of warming 
in the winter, but the average summer temperature, we're looking at maybe half a degree to 0.75 degrees. Okay, so the winter is warming faster than the summer in the Arctic. Okay, this over here is um, like the, the standard deviation. Okay, so we see this and we want to zoom in and look at Utah and say, okay, well, yeah, we're looking at 1 to 1.5 degrees of warming on average over a decade. Okay, so the average temperature going up about 1 degree. Hmm. What about evaporation? Water runoff, specific humidity, soil moisture, relative humidity. Okay, let's see here. A bit less evaporation because there's less moisture in our soil. Right, here's soil moisture. Oh, that doesn't look great. We're looking at 5% decrease in soil moisture by the year 2035. Okay. Um, perhaps a bit more humidity in our air. That could be nice. That's because the earth is warmer overall and so the oceans are evaporating faster. Soil runoff, as soil has less moisture in it, it's more compacted and so it doesn't absorb as much water, so that means erosion. So we're looking at increase in erosion, decrease in moisture, a um, little bit of decrease of evaporation because there's not as much moisture there to begin with and decrease in relative humidity rather than the increase in specific humidity. Okay. Here's two more little plots. It's all from that IPCC. Okay. Change in salinity and sea surface temperature. Alright, so yeah, we're going up in sea surface temperature. Goodbye coral reefs. Got it. Okay they're doomed and right in here this dark blue at the top left is to me one of the scarier bits this sharp drop in salinity in the ocean right up there what might be my problem with that well how to get there in the first place if all this ice the polar ice cap starts melting that's fresh water it goes in it drops the salinity but the problem here is that Salinity is what drives ocean currents in large part. Okay. Um, hypersaline water is more dense, so it sinks, and that's pulling water behind it because water bonds, right? Those nice hydrogen bonds. And so as it sinks into deep ocean trenches, like say right through here, um, that's pulling the rest of the water and it's driving a big part of ocean currents. Ocean currents are the reason why the Sahara is the Sahara and the Amazon is the Amazon. So this is pretty huge. If we get a decrease in salinity, that will slow down ocean circulation and we'll start seeing crazy weather patterns from that. Okay. Now these aren't just a single model like our little our trout thing we saw. These are 20 independent research groups from around the world coming up with their own models. They all got the same data to play with. They decided what variables might be important. They tested those. They built a model. They weren't allowed to talk to each other. And then they reported their results. So here's a bunch of different predictions for mean precipitation response. This is a change in the annual precipitation average over a 10 year scale. <clears throat> So some, this model here is showing that some decreases in precipitation, some increases in precipitation. All right. This model is showing something similar. This one's somewhat similar. This one's a bit different. Okay. What they do for the final report, though, is rather than just pick one of these, because they're all slightly different, they pick different variables. They had slightly different math going on in the background okay. in their model of reality. We take all of these and take the average. So here, excuse me, here's the average predicted mean precipitation response. Okay, doesn't look great for Utah, which is already a desert. Okay, here's the same thing for temperature. You can see some of their models actually had 
predicted cooling up here over by Greenland. Okay, not all of them, but when we average these all together, we can see there's a bit of a light spot here. The average model prediction is for maybe slight warming there. Okay. Well, here's something for you ski bums. Um, I don't like snow, so I don't ski, but here's the year 2035. Wait. No, this is 2041 to 2070. Okay. This model has 80% accuracy. It's harder to predict this snowpack, all right? But look at this 30% of our current snowpack is what they're predicting for the years 2041 to 2070. Okay, right there in the Wasatch and Uinta region. Okay, a lot less snowpack. I guess good, probably not good considering that's where we get our water and most of our tourism income in the state. But at least I won't have as much snow to deal with as I die of dehydration. Let's take a look at this warming over time. This is kind of a neat image here. And it's showing it circular as it goes around the months of the year. And this is the average global temperature. Here's 1920. There it is. So you can see. Okay. Looks like it's getting a bit warmer. Okay. Yep going right up there. All right, so it's hovering around here for a long time. What causes it to spike out there towards our 1.5? That's the tipping point when, when all the coral dies and the fishery industry collapses, all that good stuff. What happened? The Industrial Revolution. Yeah, we started digging up all those old dinosaur food plants and turning them back into CO2, okay? Now, you may be a skeptic about this, but I would say the word skeptic probably isn't right. It's more like um, ignorant, okay? Skeptics have good reason to believe something, all right? Let me show you. This is observed temperatures right here, okay? This is land slash ocean temperature, the average there, okay? This is our 1880 to 1910 average this line okay so what's causing this warming could be the earth's orbit okay this is the amount of warming shown here in blue caused by earth's orbital changes because it does fluctuate okay here you can kind of see the 95 percent confidence intervals going around that so we're looking at some uncertainty here also okay this is reality what has happened this is the amount of that fluctuation due to the Earth's orbit changing. Well, what else could it be? I've heard lots of people say it's just the sun, it's like solar spots. There it is, that's the warming from the sun. Okay, what else? Volcanoes, of course. Yep. Huh, so here's the warming caused by volcanoes. Wait a second, that was an eruption. That was an eruption. That was an eruption. Volcanoes can actually cool the Earth. They're putting all kinds of um, aerosols, which block out sunlight. Okay, so volcanic activity can actually cool the Earth and do some have some offsets for this kind of thing. We combine all three of those. We call these the natural factors. Average them, and there it is. There's our natural factors. We call this a forcing in climate science. This is the forcing of these natural factors on average global temperature. Okay. Could be deforestation, so land use changes. Looks like overall we're doing a little bit of cooling from that. Ozone pollution? No, not much. Aerosol pollution? Again, that's actually cooling the planet the more crap we, we spray into the air. All those little aerosols that give us cancer, um, at least they're cooling the planet a little bit. 
I guess. Here's the greenhouse gas. That's the, the uh, atmospheric forcing of greenhouse gases on average temperature. Okay. So this is saying that greenhouse gases should have our average temperature be about 1.5 degrees warmer at this point. How come our reality is lower? Right? Things aren't as bad as greenhouse gases would lead us to believe. Well, stick all the factors together, and there you have it. So, let's see here. There's greenhouse gases, ozone, land use, combine them. All right. So some of these things cause cooling, some cause warming, like greenhouse gases. Combine all the human factors, and then combine the human and the natural factors. And this is this red line here is what the predicted temperature should be according to all those things. And then there's what we've observed. All right. It really is greenhouse gases causing warming right now, causing all the climate change. Okay. We can even measure um, the isotopes in those gases. Okay. Things that were fixed long ago in ferns during the Carboniferous period when dinosaurs were around. Okay. Those had a different photosynthetic pathway than stuff that's fixed now. All right. So when we dig up coal and oil, it's a heavier carbon. And that's exactly what we're seeing in the atmosphere. All right. So the earth is getting warmer. It's because of us digging up old dinosaur food and burning it as fast as possible. Okay. Well, that's fine. More or less, I suppose, if you don't care about coral reefs or fishing or, you know, ocean health or agriculture in Utah, but okay. All this really means is that our biomes are going to shift. And that's what we're looking at right here. Okay. Biomes are mainly due to temperature and precipitation. So if we change temperature and precipitation, we change the biomes. Okay. So we've got desert biomes, right? We've got savanna, we've got tropical forests, and you can see how they kind of grow in these bands, all right? Biomes are in these different areas. Those bands correspond almost perfectly with temperature and precipitation. Okay. Do you need me to walk you through these biomes, what a tropical forest is, what a savanna is? No. You can look at those. Great. Okay. It's all about location. So here's a picture of the same area taken 30, 35 years apart. I believe one was in 1970 on the left and then 1995 on the right. I'm not entirely sure about that. Okay. Same area. What happened? One biome got turned into another. We went from a savanna grassland, pretty dry, to a arid, horrifying desert. This one wasn't climate change. Precipitation didn't change drastically over this time period. We just added cattle and they started grazing in here on the left. Okay. As the cattle graze, they remove some of the grass. It's holding moisture. It's keeping moisture in the ground. Okay. As it dies off, parts of it rot, that evaporates, and it's a cascading effect. Okay. So we can change one biome into another relatively easily or accidentally just by changing little things about it. Okay. Uh, aquatic biomes, you know what lakes and reefs are. That's a lake, that's a river, coral reef, those are all gonna die anyway because of climate change, okay. Pelagic zone, um, yeah, we'll stop it there.